welcome to all um, to our Hebrew University's uh, webinar series. I'm happy to share that today, honorary doctorate from Hebrew University, a radio professor of scripture emerita at Boston University and distinguished visiting professor of comparative religion at the Hebrew University, Paula Fredriksen, will introduce Dr. Miriam Goldstein. Um, Paula, she is an historian of ancient Christianity, is also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and holds honorary doctorates from universities in the United States, Sweden, and Israel. Her most recent book, When Christian Were Jews from Yale, interpret the first 40 years of this Jewish messianic movement within the complex religious and political ecosystem established between Jerusalem and Rome. Uh, now, I would also remind you that the lecture will be around 30 minutes, and then we will open to question and answer session. You're welcome to, to raise your digital hand or write the question in the chat, but then we will answer, or Miriam will answer, only after the lecture. And now, Paula, would you please kick off our much-anticipated uh, webinar? With, with great pleasure. Welcome, everybody. It's uh, a privilege uh, and a pleasure. Uh, to introduce our wonderful speaker, Dr. Miriam Goldstein, who was born, born in Boston, as we say in Boston, uh, born in Boston, Massachusetts. She studied at Harvard College and the University of Cambridge, and then uh, completed her doctorate locally at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in 2007. Uh, Miriam's research focuses on medieval Judeo-Arabic literature and inter-religious relations between Jews, Christians, and Muslims in the medieval Arabic-speaking world. She is the author of Karaite Exegesis in Medieval Jerusalem and the editor of Beyond Religious Borders, Interaction and Intellectual Exchange in the Medieval Islamic World, as well as numerous articles on Arabic and on Judeo-Arabic literature. And she currently chairs the Department of Arabic Language and Literature at the Hebrew University. Cher colleague, you're on, <laughs> welcome. Thank you so much, Paula. Thank you, Mara. It's really a pleasure to be here. Hello to all of you, um, wherever you are, whatever time it is with you. Um, I teach at the Hebrew University. I live in Jerusalem. I'm usually found on Mount Scopus during the day. Um, I work on Judeo-Arabic literature, meaning what Jews wrote in Arabic, beginning around the ninth century and through the Ottoman period. Currently, I'm mostly focusing on polemic, um, including links between the Near East and the Mediterranean in Europe. And I'll be happy to talk about that more in the questions at the end. It's really a pleasure to be with you and I'm grateful to my university for giving me the opportunity to talk to a broad audience from hopefully around the world. Um, what I hope you come out with today after my talk. Um, my talk is focused on Judeo-Arabic literature and culture from its beginnings and through the medieval period. I hope that you're going to learn about the extent of the Jewish culture that existed in Arabic during what we might call the medieval period. And I also hope you come away with an understanding of why this Judeo-Arabic literature and culture is important for understanding the Judaism that you might be familiar with today. Before I show any maps or present any of the history, I want to talk about what is Judeo-Arabic? What does it look like? Um, so a simple definition of Judeo-Arabic, um, it could look like a letter from a mother to her son. This letter is from what's called the Cairo Geniza, a trove of manuscripts that we can talk about later. Um, it could be an autograph, a manuscript copy written by Maimonides. This is Maimonides' Guide to the Perplexed in the original Judeo-Arabic, um, meaning it was written in the 12th century. This is, a, you're looking at a 12th century manuscript. Or it could be a work like this. This is a theological work from the 10th century, a copy of a work that was written by a Karaite scholar living in Baghdad in the 10th century. Um, if you look close, you can see Hebrew letters in this manuscript as well. Um, this is a text that's in Arabic characters, 
but you can see that Hebrew letters crop up in it as well. So the simple definition of Judeo-Arabic, for example, looking at this one, we could say it's Arabic in Hebrew letters. So what does that mean? That can be a little bit complicated to understand. So it means this text is written in the Arabic language, but the characters, the letters in which it's written are Hebrew letters. Now there are exceptions to this, as you see, for example, in this slide, um, in which the letters are mostly in Arabic with a few Hebrew letters here and there. So it's not just the letters that make me call it Judeo-Arabic as opposed to regular Arabic. Um, it's also the use of Hebrew and Aramaic words for religious concepts. For example, if I'm, let's say I'm a, I'm a Jew using the English language in the United States, I might have said, um, last year, I, last month, we built our sukkah, not we built our booth, or she read the Torah wonderfully on her bat mitzvah, and not she read the Pentateuch on the day she took upon herself the fulfilling of commandments. So it's very normal that we would use, that Jews would use Hebrew and Aramaic words um, in the middle of their speech in English. So the same thing in Arabic. They would write in Arabic, but for certain important words, in this case, by the way, Yeshua, uh, Jesus, they use the Hebrew, the Hebrew name for Jesus. Um, now you're probably familiar with other examples of Jewish languages. Examples where Jews used a local language, but in which they wrote this language in Hebrew script, in Hebrew letters. But I want to make the point that the case of Judeo-Arabic is quite different. Um, quite different from, I, I would claim, any other Jewish language that you could come up with. Um, one is because of the complete immersion of Jews in the Arabic language during the time period that I'm going to discuss, culturally, linguistically, intellectually. So if you envision a Jew in medieval Europe, okay, let's say 12th, 13th, 14th century medieval Europe, they write and speak the local or regional language, maybe even in their house, they might even speak the local language. But in most cases, this Jew would not or could not be a participant in the surrounding intellectual culture, which would take place in a different language, in Latin. This is not the case for Jews in the Arabic speaking environments that we're gonna be talking about tonight. In these environments, one language was the one used on the street, the same one used for scholarship and scholarly interactions. So there was this nearly seamless transition between Arabic external culture and Judeo-Arabic. Um, now, this language change that we're going to talk about, that is, when Jews adopted Arabic, what was the significance of this language change? Um, this created an absolute sea change in Jewish culture. Um, and I'm gonna give you the two major reasons uh, as we get into a discussion of the history and the maps and when it was that Jews began using Arabic. So one is the function. During the period that we're going to talk about, when Jews used Arabic um, as their major language of communication, their major language of scholarship, Arabic was the language of intellectual uh, pursuit, of culture, of innovation. Arabic was the continuation of the learning of the classical world. And the second reason is that in taking and adopting Arabic as their language, Jews were speaking the same language as their neighbors. There were interchanges between Jews and their neighbors that could take place in an incredibly wide spectrum of fields. So the story of Judeo-Arabic literature that we're going to talk about tonight is one of intense exchange with Jews cultural and intellectual surroundings. Now, how many Jews did this impact? What's the community we're talking about? So the estimate of historians is that some 90% of the Jewish population was resident in the Arabic speaking world during the medieval period that we're speaking about. Um, now, let's go to how did this change occur? How did it come to happen that Judeo, that Arabic, became, uh, sorry, pardon me, that Judeo-Arabic became the language 
that Jews used. Um, so for that, we have to turn to a little bit of history. So why Judeo-Arabic? Why did Jews adopt the Arabic language for use? So we have to start with a little history. So this begins with a political and then a linguistic transition. So here I'm showing you a slide of the ancient world. Um, so you can see the empires that were important at the time, the Sasanian empire, the remains of the Roman empire. Um, this is the world on the eve of the Muslim conquests. Um, a, charismatic new lead, a charismatic leader named Muhammad ibn Abdullah is born in the Arabian Peninsula at some point in the seventh century. He begins to preach a new religion. Okay, so we're talking about the area on this map. If you look in the place we call Saudi Arabia today, the place that's labeled Mecca. Mecca. Um, Muhammad begins to preach and he's very convincing. He's charismatic and convincing and his armies begin to move out from today's Saudi Arabia throughout the Near East and Mediterranean. They're spreading a religion. They're taking over territory as a government. They're establishing new cities, but they are also spreading a language. And so this is the initial uh, extent of the Muslim empire. It's called the Umayyad Caliphate. You can see on the map, it's dated to, this map is dated to 750. And in a very large area of the Near East and the Mediterranean basin has been unified under one government, to some extent, one religion, although Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians, Manichaeans, there are many, there's a variety of religions in this empire and increasingly one language. And the Arabic language, even to a, to a greater extent than the Islamic religion, the Arabic language made a conquest of these areas. Um, so the next map you can see uh, is the year 900, what's called the Abbasid Empire, a bit larger. Those of you who are familiar with the history of Spain can see that at this point, Spain is com nearly completely under Muslim control. And then we look at the Jewish communities under this Muslim rule. So this map is the map that I'm talking about when I say that there's an estimate that some 90% of the Jews of the world are living within the borders of this Arabic speaking empire. And if you wanna see the communities in, in particular, many of them are detailed on this map. Okay, so some very large communities, Jerusalem, uh, Cairo, um, Constantinople, um, and other smaller communities. Um, you can follow the dotted line around to see the extent of the Muslim rule here. So Jews were now uni unified under a single government, which hadn't happened for a very long time. And soon they would be adopting a single language, the Arabic language, okay? And this was the case for Jews. It was the case for Christians. Christians um, oftentimes maintain their Christianity like Jews oftentimes did, but they took on a new language. And by the time we get to the eighth or ninth century, um, the Islamic uh, conquest began in the second half of the seventh century. And by the time we get a century, a century and a half into Muslim rule, it is very clear that both Jews and Christians have become native speakers of Arabic to the extent that they begin to render their scriptures in Arabic. We find the first translations of Christian parts of the Bible of the Tanakh into Arabic in the late eighth and early ninth century. So this is a very important um, evidence of the fact that communities are becoming native Arabic speakers. So what is the result of this adoption of the Arabic language that came with Islamic government and rule? So the result was very striking and extensive changes in what Jews wrote. And when I say what, I mean what in a very broad sense of the word. So I mean, not just the language they wrote in, but the subjects they wrote about, the genres in which they wrote, and even the style in which they wrote their works. 
the Jewish bookshelf before the Islamic conquest and the Jewish bookshelf a century or two after the Islamic conquest are two very different entities. So I wanna show you what I'm talking about. So a snapshot of Jewish literature in the year 500. Um, so we obviously have the Bible, the Mishnah and the Talmud, Midrash, various collections of Midrash have been created and edited by, by the time we get to the end of the fifth century. We have mystical literature. We have the beginnings of early religious poetry. What do we have? And I've just chosen the year 1000. Okay, so some, let's say 100, 150 years of strong production in Judeo-Arabic. So what do we have? We have all of the above, plus line by line commentaries on the Bible, theological compositions, codes of law that are written like codes organized by subject, guides to philosophy or independent philosophical works, grammars, grammars of Hebrew, grammars of other Semitic languages such as Aramaic, dictionaries, works on astronomy, medical compositions, and lots more. And all of these were written in Arabic. And I should also note that it is not, it's not only the genre and it's not only the topics that are being discussed here that were new. It was also the way that these works were written. There are new ways of writing, new styles. Um, and I'm gonna bring you an example here. One example is on the next slide. So I'm gonna skip a lot of interesting details that I could say about this manuscript. <laughs> it's, it's actually part of my, my research. It was written by a Karaite author in 10th century Baghdad. It's a Bible commentary. Um, as you can see, um, these are Hebrew letters and it's the Arabic language. Um, the concept of authorship is very clear in this work. So we'll just zoom in on this, um, pardon my use of the word zoom. Zoom is, zoom is good, zoom is good. Um, the first line, the author is completely present. I'm gonna read it to you and I'm gonna translate. So he says, this is just a title, B'Shem Adonai El Olam, and a verse from the Torah, from the Tanakh. And he says, this 10th century Karaite author, his name is Al-Kirkasani. He says, So he says, I, when I finished compiling that book regarding the, my commentary on the Torah, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he, the author is present from the beginning. Um, this is a very important change, which I'm not going to talk about much tonight, but it's a change in the concept of writing and authorship that occurs for Jews um, around the 9th and 10th century, okay, with the adoption of Arabic. You declare yourself as author, and this shows up very clearly in writing. And this is evident in all of the genres that I noted on the previous slide. Um, the author begins with himself. If you were to continue in this manuscript, you would see that his work is organized. Many works use chapters for the first time in Jewish literature, okay? The first chapters that you will find in Jewish literature, and I leave Philo out of this. I see I, Paula could probably say a lot to me about that, but I will leave Philo out. Um, but it's the first time we find organization in chapters. Um, the type, it's a type of organization and attitude to authorship that we take for granted today, but which was very new in this period for Jews and for others, by the way. Um, and I'll just note that this is a topic that I have actually spent a lot of research time on, which fascinates me. And I recently edited a collection of articles devoted to the questions of authorship. And I, I did this in an important venue at the Hebrew University that I wanted to mention tonight. It's a journal called Jerusalem Studies in Arabic and Islam, which is more than 40 years old. It's a real flagship of the Hebrew University and of my institute, uh, the Institute of Asian and African Studies. And it's in need of a sponsor. So if anybody is interested in particularly supporting very important research endeavors at the Hebrew University, this would enable us to continue to maintain a journal that's one of the top journals for Arabic and Islam in the world. But in any case, there's an issue uh, which I edited 
together with my colleague was devoted to authorship, this concept of authorship. So back to medieval times. Um, so this period that we're talking about, the adoption of Arabic, the creation of the Abbasid empire, ushered in a golden age of creative composition in Judeo-Arabic, some 300 years. Now, the main point of my talk today is to introduce you to the idea that the fact that all of these genres began in Arabic, all of these new attitudes to writing began in Judeo-Arabic meant that they became part of the Jewish library. They became part of what Jews thought of when they thought of Jewish scholarship. These are things that we take for granted today. For example, codes of law, codes of law that are organized by topic, that are written with a table of contents, with chapters, with internal cross-references, as opposed to the Talmud. The Talmud is definitely a code of law, but it hangs together in sort of a stream of consciousness style. So Judeo-Arabic works initiated the idea of codes of law that were organized in the way we expect today. Um, verse by verse Bible commentaries. Now, of course, the Midrash is a fine Bible commentary and it definitely existed. Uh, collections of Midrash existed before Judeo-Arabic. But the idea that the Bible, that a Jew, by the way, for Christians, this existed earlier. But the idea that a Jew, a Jewish commentator would sit down and like we expect to see in Rashi, uh, to go verse by verse by verse, this was new. And this first began in Judeo-Arabic. The idea that Judaism has dogma, that there are lists of theological ideas that a Jew must believe. This began in Judeo-Arabic. The idea of comparative Semitic linguistic work. Jews may have been the first to do this, okay? As speakers of at least, or users of at least three Semitic languages. Muslims used one Semitic language, Arabic. Jews used Arabic, Hebrew, and Aramaic. So this naturally led them to, to want to investigate the connections between Semitic languages. So all of these were new and began in Judeo-Arabic. When Jewish scholarship was by definition carried out in Arabic, and when 90% of the Jewish population expected it to be that way, this was their native language. Um, now to delve into the specifics of this would be a full length course. And I know this because I teach it at the Hebrew University. But for today, I hope that I'm giving you a sense of what changed, what was new and why it's important. Now I want to give you a taste for the sort of details of this period via two bookends and the bookends that I want to show you tonight are the beginning of this time, the time when Jews began to use Judeo-Arabic in a serious way for scholarship. And then I want to talk to you at the end, around the 12th century, when it is very evident that there is a shift away from using Judeo-Arabic for scholarship. And when Hebrew, again, becomes the language in which Jews write. So I want to do it uh, via two major figures. So the first figure is the figure, I have written it for you, Saadia ben Yosef al-Fayyumi, also known as Saadia Gaon. So envision the late ninth, early 10th century. So you already know from what I've said that most Jews in the world are speaking Arabic as a native language, but scholarship is it in a different place. The major scholars are in the yeshivot of the area of Baghdad. They're continuing to write mostly in Aramaic, to some extent in Hebrew. And these are languages that Jews outside the world of scholarship have very little connection to. They have Arabic as a native language. They really can't understand what's being written in the yeshivot very well anymore. Think about what is going on outside the world of the yeshiva of the world of the Babylonian yeshiva. An entire world has opened up in Arabic. It's peopled by scholars of a variety of religions, Islam, Christianity, Zoroastrianism, Manichaeism. Many works from the classical period are being translated from Greek, oftentimes via Syriac into Arabic. The Jews of the period are exposed to this. A Jew in the late ninth century, the early 10th century, 
is living in cosmopolitan places, for example, Baghdad, Baghdad. Uh, no one is holed up inside their own religious circle. Everyone has Arabic as a common language. This new world, philosophy, theology, science, it's very interesting, fascinating, new to Jews. Who can bridge this gap? The gap between the traditional Jewish world, which, whose scholarship is being carried out in the yeshivas of the Geonim in Babylonia, and this cosmopolitan world that's happening outside in Arabic. So enter Saadia ben Yosef, Saadia Gaon. So he's born in Egypt in the year 882. He's clearly a scholar from the beginning. You can tell by what he writes about himself. He's born in actually in a very, in a small village in Egypt. He's not born in one of the major intellectual centers. He travels in the land of Israel. He spends time in Tiberias and he arrives in Baghdad to become a leader there, as I will describe. Saadia is clearly gifted. He writes his first work, which is a dictionary for poets called the Egron, a dictionary of biblical Hebrew. He writes it at age 20. Um, so that's what the year 902. Um, he has vision, he's daring, and he's also not afraid of conflicts. We know Sa'adia from historical sources as someone who had um, not a few conflicts with other leaders of the Jewish community. Sa'adia begins work apparently from quite early on on what would become his most famous and long lasting enterprise what's called his tafsir. Tafsir in Arabic means a commentary or a translation. And it is his translation of the Torah into Arabic. Um, he begins and he work, it is apparent from what he writes that he works on this his whole life. It's something he devotes himself to. As I explained to students just this morning, um, Saadia's translation of the Torah into Arabic becomes so canonical that it takes the world by storm. It, uh, it is even adopted by non-Jewish communities of uh, the Copts and the Samaritans as their translation of the Torah, the Pentateuch into Arabic. Um, Saadia overall is a visionary and he sets it as his goal. This is very clear from what he writes to ensure that this world of Arabic scholarship that's happening outside the walls of the Babylonian yeshiva needs to be made at home in Jewish scholarship. Many people, he has been called in research, the traditional revolutionary. He's revolutionary in that he begins to write scholarly works in Judeo-Arabic. He, for the first time, a Jewish leader writes about Jewish religious texts in Arabic. It happens to be Judeo-Arabic, he apparently wrote in Hebrew letters, but that's, that's uh, the language. He has made a decision that he's not going to be sticking to the old languages, to Aramaic, to Hebrew. He realizes that to reach this cosmopolitan audience in Baghdad and in other major centers, he must write in Judeo-Arabic because otherwise he's gonna lose them. What's going on outside is, is too interesting. If Sa'adia does not take up a new language and make the, the intellectual currents that are happening outside a part of what he writes about Judaism, then nobody's gonna read him and nobody's gonna hold on to Judaism. Um, and that's what he does. He takes the theology that is current in his day and in a very conscious way, he brings it into what he writes about the Bible. And I believe that he was doing this in, in a very conscious way. Um, Sa'adia establishes a precedent in what he does. And from then on, from Sa'adia was active in the first third, sorry, the first half of the 10th century. From then on, it becomes completely acceptable to write Jewish scholarship in Judeo-Arabic. It's the default choice for writing for at least the next 200 years. So what I wanna show you now uh, is an example of Saadia's, uh, what this tafsir looks like. What did his translation look like? Um, so here I'm showing you where he's from, Baghdad or where he flourished, Baghdad, where he, where he was from is over here in Egypt. Um, so this is an example. This is um, one of our most ornate and earliest manuscripts of Sa'adia's tafsir. 
So you can see that much of the page you're looking at is Hebrew. It's the original biblical verse with all of the Masoretic voweling um, and all of the, the um, Ta'amim, the Masoretic uh, signs for reading. And then you can see that in between each of the Hebrew verses is Sa'adia's Arabic translation. And you can see this is an incredibly ornate manuscript, a beautiful square script for the Hebrew script um, and a not, no less beautiful square script for the Judeo-Arabic. Um, so this is an example of Sadia's most canonical work, um, his translation, which, by the way, lived on in Jewish communities until the, the, until the last century, when these communities came to Israel and uh, stopped using Judeo-Arabic for spoken speech. But this is for nearly 1,000 years this translation of the Torah was part of the life of Jewish communities. The next figure I want to present is the other bookend. So we talked about the adoption of Arabic. Now I wanna talk about when this ended. Um, and when I talk about when this ended, I'm not saying that Jews stopped using Arabic as a spoken language because Jewish communities used Arabic as a spoken language until, uh, until pretty much the foundation of the state of Israel and until many of them came. Um, but I'm talking about the default use of Judeo-Arabic for scholarship. So I want to present a figure that I'm sure all of you have heard of, Moshe ben Maimon, Musa bin Maimon, Maimonides. Um, Maimonides was, was born in Cordoba in Spain uh, in, the early, in the early 12th century. Um, the date, uh, by the way, is debated among the researchers, maybe 1137, maybe 1138. He was born in Cordoba, but because of uh, various um, difficult aspects of his life, um, the invasion of I the Iberian Peninsula by Berber tribes from North Africa, Maimonides and his family fled when he was quite young and he, they moved to North Africa, spending time in Morocco uh, and then they, Maimonides and his family settled down in Egypt, and he died in Egypt in the year 1204. Now, I'll preface and I'll say that many details about Maimonides' biography are unclear. You can pick up any one of a number of studies of Maimonides in English, fascinating reading, um, and you'll see different opinions and conclusions, one of them being, did Maimonides ever convert to Islam? This is debated in research. Um, the Berber tribes that took over Spain and North Africa were tribes that insisted upon conversion. So it's a question, did Maimonides convert? Um, what is clear is that he was born in the brilliant society that was Andalusia, El Andalus, a world that was like the East of Rapsadia Gaon, wonderfully varied, linguistically, religiously, scholastically. Now Maimonides wrote a wide variety of works. The majority of them were in Judeo-Arabic. This was expected. In the 12th century, Judeo-Arabic was still in its heyday. And Maimonides from Cordoba, in Cordoba definitely in those areas of Southern Spain during the time in which Maimonides was a child, Judeo-Arabic would have been the language that was spoken. Jews would have been writing in Judeo-Arabic. And in the North Africa that Maimonides lived in, this was certainly the case. But one work he wrote in Hebrew. This work was his Mishnet Torah, a legal code, canonical then, canonical now. He wrote it in Mishnaic Hebrew um, in a very beautiful style. And consider that his native language was most assuredly Arabic and not Hebrew. So it's a very, very beautiful Mishnaic Hebrew that he chose to write. Um, Maimonides receives a request from a Jew living in Baghdad, a Jew named uh, Yusuf O Yosef Ibn Jaber. Um, this Jew appreciated Maimonides' work in Judeo-Arabic and his Hebrew wasn't good enough to read the Mishneh Torah. And he wrote Maimonides asking him if he could translate his Mishneh Torah into Arabic so that he could more easily read it. Um, so here, here's the original letter. By the way, Maimonides' letters even during his lifetime were saved um, and they've been passed down over the generations. We have large collections 
of the letters that were sent to Maimonides and what he responded to them. Um, so this is the request in Hebrew. The letters survived in Arabic and in a Hebrew translation, which is somewhat fuller. So I'm translating from the fuller Hebrew translation, which reflects um, Arabic that was not preserved. So let me read to you, how did Maimonides respond personally to this uh, Baghdadi Jew who writes to him? So he says, I tell you, do not minimize your capabilities and do not lose hope. Many of our great sages began studying at a late age and achieved great things. And you too should try to learn the Hebrew that I used in composing this work in the Mishneh Torah. For it is easy to understand and not at all difficult to learn. After you practice it in one section, you will understand the composition as a whole. And then Maimonides says to Yosef Ibn Jabir, and I refuse to even consider translating it into the Arabic language for its grace would be lost. Indeed, I am hoping to restore the commentary on the Mishnah in Arabic and the book of commandments to the holy tongue. So he's thinking, so Maimonides, uh, I'll finish that I should translate this composition into the Arabic language, request this not. Now, Maimonides is not saying this because he doesn't believe that Arabic is a great language, that Arabic, he believes, probably like his translators, that Arabic is the easiest language to use for writing about philosophy, for writing about medicine, for writing about almost anything you wanted. Arabic is an incredibly rich, and, and by that time, a, a very well-used language. He has nothing against Arabic. What Maimonides realizes is that if he wants to speak to Jewish communities around the world, and especially to the growing Jewish communities of Europe, that he needs to start writing in Hebrew and not in Judeo-Arabic. So he tells this uh, requester of his, Joseph Ibn Jabr, do not ask me to translate anything into Arabic, indeed, I am thinking about restoring my Arabic, he uses the word restoring. I'm translating my Judeo-Arabic compositions into Hebrew. Um, now, a second letter that I want to show you um, with which we'll conclude in order to illustrate this sort of bookend period in which it's clear that the scepter is moving from the East to the West, that the center of scholarship is moving from Arabic speaking areas to Europe. Um, I want to show you another letter that Maimonides wrote. Um, and this was a letter that he wrote to a European community, to the community of Lunel in, in France, in Southern France. And they had requested of him, so they had a different problem, right? They could not read his Judeo-Arabic works. And this is a constant um, feature of the 11th and 12th century that the growing communities in France have connections with the communities in Iberia or in the East. And they realize that there are these wonderful works in Judeo-Arabic that they can't read. And they ask, we have frequent um, letters, other historical documents where they discuss the idea of translation. So he had a request, Maimonides received a request from the community of Lunel in France to translate his Guide to the Perplexed into Hebrew. Um, Guide to the Perplexed, Dalalat uh, al-Ha'irin, and it was written in Arabic. Um, so he responds to them in a very different way. So let's see what he says. Um, so this is the letter in the original Hebrew. He would corresponded, of course, with that community in Hebrew. Um, so he says, um, and what you requested, that I would translate it for you into the holy tongue. So he's, of course, talking about the Guide to the Perplexed. He says, would I had the days of old to carry out this request for this book and for the other books that I have composed in the moribund language of Kedar, he means Arabic, for I have dwelled in their tents. So he basically says, I've been living in Arabic speaking land, so I wrote in Arabic, but I wish that I could carry out your request for this book and for other books. And I would gain great pleasure from this to sift the wheat from the chaff and to return the lost item to its owners. So he uses metaphors from the sources to talk about how ideally he would like to translate his Judeo-Arabic works 
into Hebrew. So I want to stop there with that quote, but what it makes clear is that Maimonides clearly has a strong sense of the fact that at this point in time, Judeo-Arabic is no longer the language to use if you want to be able to speak to the broad Jewish community that has grown up in the past, let's say 300 years, in the years between Sa'ad Yaga'on and between the time of Maimonides. Um, at, by the end of the 12th century, it's clear to Maimonides, and you can see this in, in the letters that I've shown you, that the communities of Southern France, the communities of Iberia, are the heirs of the learning tradition that had till then been centered in the East and had been centered in the Judeo-Arabic language. So from this point, from around this point on, I mean, we're talking about a gradual change, Hebrew takes the lead. And from about the 12th century, the late 12th century on, late 12th, early 13th century on, if Judeo-Arabic works were not translated into Hebrew, their chance of continued transmission and survival was low. Now, I'm generalizing and I'm speaking very broadly. There were pockets of wonderful transmission and preservation of Judeo-Arabic works. One of these is the valuable collections of the Yemenite community. They brought these manuscripts with them to Israel when they immigrated um, in, during the, the 20th century. Um, but overall, if an author's works, no matter how canonical he was, we could even be talking about Sa'ad Yagon, if an author's Judeo-Arabic works were not translated into Hebrew by the time the 12th century was over, um, it is very difficult to, to find their works. Um, so for me today, that means that much of my research is based on manuscripts, often found in Genizot, that is where Jews put old and worn out books and papers. And all of this is because of the language change that I've discussed. First of all, the adoption of Arabic or the, um, the use of Arabic in scholarly context starting in the ninth century, and then the change around the end of the 12th century. Now, the central points that I mentioned earlier that, that were the exciting, innovative, new parts of Judeo-Arabic literature, the genres, the new subjects, the parts that, that began in the ninth and 10th centuries and were new to Jewish literature, structure of compositions, the writing style, these remain. How do they remain? This is because the Hebrew works that were written during the 12th century and beyond in today's Spain and France and in other places as well, in many cases incorporate this rich Judeo-Arabic culture that I've discussed. Um, one example that I can give you that some of you might be familiar with, Abraham Ibn Ezra. Abraham Ibn Ezra wrote his Bible commentaries and his mathematical works and his scientific works in, to a large extent in Hebrew, but he's quoting and referencing Judeo-Arabic sources the whole way. He's a real um, liminal figure in this period. These Judeo-Arabic works are like icebergs under the ocean. They're vast and they're basic and a level of base, but you can't see them. The visible part of Jewish scholarship beginning for the most part in the 12th century and on, is written in Hebrew. And the vast literature in Judeo-Arabic that preceded them is either in the best case, preserved only in manuscript, this is work for me and my colleagues, or in the worst case, lost in the original. And, and that is the case even for the works of Sa'ad Yagon. It is my pleasure that I get to spend my research hours and even my teaching at the Hebrew University dealing with these fascinating works. So thank you very much. Thank you, Miriam. It was really very, very interesting. And we have already a few questions, both in chat and in the question and answer box. So um, I think I will begin with the question and answer box. Um, we have a question. I will read it to you. Was the reason from, for translating Hebrew literature and holy documents into Arabic intended to educate Muslims about the Jewish religion? Uh, Mohammed taught the contempt of Judaism. Okay, I love that question. Um, was it intended to teach Muslims? Well, I, I, there's, there's something, this allows me to say something 
that I would have liked to say, but didn't feel like I had time. Um, a very important feature of Jews using Arabic, a very important thing to be said, is that there are communities of Jews that were using Arabic even prior to the Islamic conquest. So first of all, it's important to say that Jews among themselves were speaking Arabic. This was just a natural thing. This wasn't something that they took upon themselves consciously. So Jews in the area of Iraq, we have historical sources from which we can understand that in the er late sixth, early seventh centuries, so prior to Muhammad, prior to Islam, these Jews were using Arabic. So this means, so think about what this means. This means that Jews would have been rendering their sources, starting with the Torah, continuing probably with collections of Midrash, um, other collections of the rabbis into Arabic, not in written form. This is a very important thing. Jews didn't really start writing things down till probably about the ninth century in any case. Um, when we talk about the Talmud, when we talk about the Midrash, we're talking about things that were transmitted orally in any case, they were not written down. But it's, I think it's pretty clear that Jews were doing this for internal usage. Um, there was actually, there's actually an important corollary though that I would say to the questioner and to anyone else who's um, thinking about this question, how did Muslims look at it? One of the, you know, the Quran has a lot of overlap with Jewish literature. Okay, I assume this is um, new to some of you, not new to others, but many stories from the Bible, many stories from Midrash and other Jewish literature are found in the Quran. So the question is, how, how is it that the Quran has these traditions? Why are they represented in the Quran? How did they get there? And one of the explanations that we can give is that these stories were being circulated in Arabic in Jewish communities, and they were available to all. Um, so I would say that Jews weren't doing this consciously for Muslims, but it certainly made the material available to Muslims. Okay, thank you. Um, in the meanwhile, um, we have an attendee. She's asking um, that she has an object written in Arabic with Hebrew letters, uh, and she's asking for your mail. So I would answer to Miriam that she, Miriam is also the attendee, um, that you can write me to my mail, and I will uh, forward with pleasure to to Dr. Goldstein. So she will answer you. Mara, can I answer one that I see in the chat? That's a great question. Yeah, of course. So uh, Ron Nassim asks, why did they use Hebrew script for Judeo-Arabic? Would it have been easier to understand if they used Arabic script? So this is a great question. The question of script and why, why did these Jews choose, if they were using the Arabic language, why didn't they use Arabic script? Um, so this gets to questions of education during this period. Um, so there are two important things to be said. One is that reading and writing were very different skills in the ancient period. So it's not like us. Thank God we all learned reading and writing together. I think all of us can say that confidently. Um, in, the, in the medieval period, definitely in the period in, in which I research, reading and writing were different skills. Not everybody learned reading and definitely not everybody learned writing. When you learned, when a Jew learned reading, reading would have been centered on the idea of the possibility of getting up in the synagogue and reading your section of the Torah. So reading Hebrew script was the essential part. To learn to read Arabic script, this would have been reserved for scholars or for people who, who felt like they wanted to access further sources. But the most basic script to which Jews were exposed was Hebrew. So for this reason, when Jews wrote Arabic, simply practically speaking, Hebrew would have been the script most accessible to them. Now, I wanna say something else that's on the practical, that's from the practical standpoint. There's also a religious theoretical standpoint here. And it's that in the Near East, religion and script were often strongly identified. So I can give an example that's not Jewish. Let's think about an example that's not Jewish. We haven't talked about Persia tonight. And I sort of glossed over that when I talked about the map and I talked about the spread 
of Arabic. And I said that the Islamic conquest could almost better be called the Arabic conquest, that even more than a religion that was spread, a language was spread. Now, a major exception to that was the area of today's Iran, Persia. Um, per Arabic did not take over in those areas. Persian remained the spoken and the used language. What script is used to write Persian? And since that period, what script was used? They took on Islam, many of them took on Islam, and they also took on the Arabic script. So they used Arabic script to write Persian, probably because the Arabic script was identified with Islam. Um, so another sort of theoretical religious reason that Jews might have wanted to write Arabic in Hebrew letters would have been that Hebrew was associated with Judaism. To some extent, we see the same thing with Christians, only to some extent, Christians actually normally wrote Arabic using Arabic script. Um, there is some use of Syriac script um, called Karshuni. You can Google it, look at, spell it with a G or a K, Karshuni. Um, but it's more of a late phenomenon. So Christians actually mostly, when they were writing Arabic, wrote Arabic in, in Arabic letters. But in any case, I would say those are two major reasons why Jews would have written Arabic in Hebrew letters. Okay. Um, so I would like to add now a few people asked if we are going to send the recording of uh, this outstanding uh, um, webinar and yes, it will be sent uh, in a few days. Now we have many questions, Miriam. So I don't want, uh, do you want to choose the, the one that seems yeah, to I see one that I would definitely like to talk about. Go for um, it. Okay, I see Stephen Berg has asked, have Judeo-Arabic works been transcribed and published in Arabic characters so that they are easier to read for those who read Arabic? This is actually very much happening today. Um, I mean, I could describe the way scholarship has come a full circle. Um, in the initial period of publishing, well, let's start with this. How do we know the things I told you today, the things I told you about? We know them because of two, two major reasons. Here, I want to um, share my screen again. Um, we know them because of two major reasons. Uh, people recognize this picture, a famous, famous picture, the Cairo Geniza. Um, it's because of Solomon Schechter, who in the late 19th century bought, brought a trove of manuscripts from Cairo, the famous story of the Cairo Geniza. And it's also because of this man. His name is um, Abraham Firkovich, uh, a Karaite from the Crimea, who had a keen eye for manuscripts, as well as very good funding from the Russian government at the time, and who collected um, more than 10,000 manuscripts from around the, the Middle East during the late 19th century. So we have, so these, these manuscripts became available pretty much in the late 19th, early 20th century. When researchers began to publish them, they often published Judeo-Arabic works in Arabic characters meaning they were written in Hebrew characters in the manuscript, but they turned them back into Arabic characters. Then there, people began to say, well, we should be publishing in the original. So they would write them, you know, like, like I would do in any article. I would render a, a manuscript. If it was in Hebrew characters, I would write it in my article in Hebrew characters. There is an increasing movement today to make Judeo-Arabic works available to contemporary Muslim communities by turning the Judeo-Arabic and taking the Hebrew characters and exactly as Stephen suggests, transcribing them and publishing them in Arabic characters. So I'll give you one example of a scholar who did this very recently. Um, he's actually a good friend of mine. And until recently he lived in Jerusalem. He's um, a Muslim named Nabi Bashir. He's from the Israeli Arab town of Sakhnin. Um, and he lived until recently in Jerusalem. He's now moved back to Sakhni. Um, but he took uh, Yehuda Halevi's Kuzari, uh, which is a work written in Judeo-Arabic, which most Jews today probably read in its medieval Hebrew translation. That became canonical. It was translated very soon after its composition into Hebrew. But in any case, Nabi Bashir took the Kuzari, 
rendered it in Arabic characters, and it has become quite widespread in the Arab world, um, in the Arab Muslim world. And the idea is that Jews indeed were a minority in the Arabic speaking areas that we're talking about today. I highly doubt that Muslims of the period that we talked about between the year 900 and let's say the year 1200 were reading many of the Jewish works that we've talked about, I doubt it. Um, the majority generally doesn't read minority culture. The minority reads majority culture. So that's probably the direction that it went in. Today though, Muslims are quite interested in these these periods of golden ages, of Iberia, of the East, when everybody was using Arabic. So there's actually a growing interest in these kinds of works. And there's a growing movement actually to, to make them available. So definitely, and it's very exciting. Really interesting. So I think um, we have uh, time for one more question. I suggest you to go in the question and answer box, if you can see it. In the chat? Uh, not the chat. There is another box question and ah. answer where there are six questions. Ah, 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 ah. Okay. Do you want to choose one? And then the rest, uh, again, you're welcome to write me the, your question and I will forward to Miriam in the next days. Okay. Um, let me talk about the Bible commentaries, what Pamela asks. Um, this is a fascinating question. Pamela asks me about the extent of the influence of the Judeo-Arabic Bible commentaries that I talked about on Bible commentaries that were written, for example, Rashi um, in the 11th century or in the 12th century and later. Um, and this also allows me to address Sheila's question about the Karaites. So I haven't talked about um, different groups of Jews, but there were many different varieties of Judaism during the period that I've talked about. So two of the major varieties were called Karaites and Rabbinites. Rabbinites would be Jews who believe in the Talmud and the oral law. Karaites were a very influential group of Jews that began around the eighth century and who rejected the idea of the Talmud as being something that was given by God, okay? This meant that the Karaites were very focused on the Tanakh, on the Bible. And they are one major reason for the flourishing of Bible commentaries during this period. So in general, one fascinating innovation of the time that I've talked about is that the Bible sort of comes back into the center of Judaism. Whereas there were a number of centuries in which the Talmud is the center and the creation of the Talmud and writing about the Talmud by during this period of writing in Judeo-Arabic, by about the 9th or 10th century, it becomes very clear that the Bible is back in the center. And this, of course, has parallels with Islam, with Christianity, and it definitely has to do with this scripturalist group, the Karaites. Um, now, um, so there's a flourishing of, of Bible commentary in particular. And if you look back, I've you have access to the recording and you look back at the slide I showed about the genres, the new genres that are created during this period, you'll notice that many of them have to do with the Bible. They're dictionaries, they're Bible commentaries, they're glossaries, which are sort of word lists of the Bible. A lot of what's being written, whether you're a Karaite or not, is focused on the Bible. So we have, and, and by the way, I would just note anyone who's looking for a, a very interesting research project, there are so many of these and they're all preserved in manuscript and they are just crying out for people to work on them. So it's a very, very, it's a field with a lot of room to move in. Um, now, these were written in Judeo-Arabic, some in the East, some in Iberia, some in North Africa. The question is, when does the move happen? Uh, what is the connection between these and between what's written in Europe? So I'm going to be very brief because I know we've been going for a while and um, this is the last question. Um, in, it is very clear that there's a, a, a large, um, there's a great extent of incorporation of these commentaries among um, commentators from Iberia. So I gave you the, the example of Abraham Ibn Ezra, who is somebody who he was a, a, a 
a Jew, I mean, you could call him a scientist, you could call him a mathematician, a philosopher, an, ex an, an incredible scholar, born in Iberia, but who wandered throughout Europe. And he wrote numerous commentaries on the Bible. He was financing himself. He would write commentaries in every place he went in order to continue to be able to, to live, to exist. Um, he's quoting, he quotes Judeo-Arabic Bible commentaries all over, and he's writing these commentaries in Hebrew for Europeans. That's very clear. In other instances, it's not so clear. So when you get to 12th and 13th century commentators, with Rashi, I think it's quite clear that Rashi wasn't reading Arabic. I'm not sure Rashi was at all exposed to these Judeo-Arabic works. With others, it's not so clear. So I'll throw out a few names. Um, the Kimchi family, um, Abarbanel, you know, other ones who may have had some sort of um, means of having access to the works that were written in Judeo-Arabic and it might have influenced them. There, this is actually a field of research that, that there's a lot more work to be done in. Um, so anyway, that's a great question. Okay, thank you a lot, Miriam. And uh, I think uh, we'll conclude here, but of course, uh, uh, again, you can write us all your question and continue your discussions with Miriam and also with Paula, if you have any question for Paula too. Um, so thank you everybody. Thank you, Paula, for introducing Miriam and taking part. My pleasure. Thank you, Miriam, for such a fabulous lecture. It was thank great. You, thank you, Paula, and thank you, Mara, and thanks to all of you for listening. It, it was really incredible and fabulous. Uh, thank you to all of you. Um, we'll have other webinars during November. You will receive the, the invitation in the mail with the recordings and hope to see you, all of you, uh, in the next webinars. Later out. Good night. Bye. Bye.